morning and welcome to Pot Up with Matthews in the Morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios, large enough to serve you, small enough to care. Uh, we got a great program for you today. Uh, in the first segment, we're going to have Terry Norvell from College Sports Today over in Jacksonville join us, talk on a little bit about all, all different types of sports. Second half of the program will be joined by former Gator uh, defensive back, Hall of Famer at the University of Florida, Kiwan Ratliff. But uh, we're going to go straight to the Titan MRI hotline. And we're joined by my good buddy, Terry Norvell. Terry, welcome to the program. How are you, bud? Man, I'm doing great. We should be reviewing last night's NCAA basketball national championship game. But, of course, <clears throat> we can't do that. So uh, we're, we're banging through here, man. Yeah, well, what you doing to pass your time over there? I know you can't take your uh, your jogs on the beach or anything like that. I mean, it's it's rough for us sports guys. Yes, uh, I've been, you know, uh, my show of college sports day is Monday and Monday and Friday, so I'm not feeling an entire week like you are, man. You guys are doing a great job, but you know, there's enough in between the days um, that, that, that's popping up. You know, um, yesterday, for instance, man, I, I, I took it as a real positive. The three big golf tournaments uh, rescheduling. I, I I think that's a great sign. But uh, yeah, we're we're piecing it together, and and you know, there's still a lot, a lot going on out there. Yeah, speaking of, you know, the PGA Tours announced that they're going to have their uh, the Masters in November. They set a date for the U.S. Open, and you know, I've always thought that I felt like golf would be the first sport back, Terry, because uh-huh. honestly. These guys in their collegiate days and their junior golf days, they played in front of just a few folks, their family and friends. Sure. So they don't really need to feed off a crowd. Obviously, golf enthusiasts love going to these tournaments, especially sure. the Masters. But um, I feel like they could be playing right now personally. Um, but, you know, what's interesting about that, that Masters weekend, I want to say Georgia plays at home and hosts Tennessee. Yeah. Which, which you know, I think that week is the the week now where most of the major schools in the SEC are playing their cupcakes, except mm-hmm. for that game. Yeah. Okay. You know that's going to be the CBS game. The Masters carries uh, the CBS carries yeah. the Masters. Then you're going to have the NFL to deal with. Uh, how do you think they're going to navigate all that? I think we were talking about that yesterday uh, on my show and. Uh, a couple things. I think it could be a lot of fun. It could be. We could be talking because keep in mind the NFL has shown they will broadcast in in the Eastern Time Zone a nine thirty game. Hell, the Jaguars play nine thirty every year now. Uh, so who knows? Shane, we may have eggs and bacon with college football. We may have midday Masters. We have afternoon. You know, I mean, everything's on the table. Obviously, college football on Saturday, but man. Saturday Masters, and I think it could be wonderful. We could be going, you know, 8 a.m. to 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 midnight with three different sports: NFL, college football, and the Masters. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, and also yesterday I was reading where ESPN is thinking about possibly taking their number one crew for college football, yeah. which is Herb Street and Chris Fowler, and moving them to Monday Night Football. I, I just think that would be a bad move. Yeah, boy, boy, they uh, they just they they lose college football. I think it would be uh, uh, awkward, and you know they tried that before. And I, I, you know, I think um, I think Booker's a college guy, you know, and and, and is a little awkward, uh, you know. Um, Joe Tessitore, I, I kind of feel like he's a college guy. When they start moving them, moving them around, um, I tell you though, everything's on the table. Uh, you know, who knows that may have to do with contracts, and they know they got to lay people off and. And uh, I think, uh, Shane, everything's on the table now in, in this climate, though. Yeah, when, you, when you're talking about college football, obviously, you know, I, I, I agree with you with, with the, the PGA Tour announcing some dates. I think we should and hopefully have a college football season. Where do you think that may happen? Do you think it's going to be the normal time or do you think it's going to change and, and start a little bit later in the year? I think we'll know here um, in – Three, four weeks, three or four weeks, we'll, we'll get a good feel. By the end of this month, I think we'll have a good feel. Um, I think right now, that that was huge to me. Remember now, the PGA, they are, I got this scratch down from my pad yesterday. The PGA scheduled their second go-around. I can't believe these three tournaments would schedule their second attempt unless they are getting great information that they can get these things played. The PGA is scheduled for August 6, 7, 8, and 9. That's right in the middle of college football um, camp. 
I mean, I think that's a great sign, um, and we'll know. I, I, Shane, I would guess right now it's probably I would I would say sixty forty they'll play on schedule college football, um, and a little less. Uh, you know, the next one will be I think that that um, that January through April with with maybe in the playoffs. I think that would be the 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 second you know odds in the clubhouse. But I, I think we still have a chance, and I have no medical background. I think we've still got a chance to get college football. Scheduled. You heard Mac Brown among some other real high-ranking coaches. Mac Brown came out last week and said, "Hey, man, we can put together a football team in three to four weeks that, that will be fine. There'll be no safety issues." We and and Mac Brown and some of the veteran coaches, as a matter of fact, said, "Man, there's times I think we overkill practice. We have too much practice." So Mac Brown and them were saying, "Man." If we get the youngsters, the student athletes on campus by mid July, get them acclimated, get them back in class, get them squared away, start start some uh, you know shell practices first week of August. This season could kick off. I say, Shane, I still think we got hope. Yeah, I do too. I think the biggest issue will be you know how many folks are going actually going to travel and go sit, sure. you know, packed into a stadium, which, you know, I still think people in the Southeastern Conference will. I don't think the attendance will be what it normally is because I think there's a little people that – several people will still be a little nervous about that. Um, but it'll, it'll be very strange, and I, I wonder if they say, okay, we'll move forward with the season, but we're going to play games with, with nobody in the stands. I, yeah, I don't boy. know how that will sit with people in the SEC. Imagine that I know one of the first huge SEC games in September is that damn Georgia at Alabama. Can you imagine Georgia rolling into Bryant Denny and there's a, a skeleton crew, a guy holding the yard marker and, and a, a guy on a camera. And, yeah. and you're and you're hearing Nick Saban screaming and Kirby Smart screaming. It, it, it would be different um, if that happens. Obviously, well, Shane, I'm going to backtrack. I think obviously already – we are going to see a major financial landscape change in college athletics. M- missing March Madness, which is the which is the big money maker, and you saw those numbers that came out last week. Instead of six hundred million, they're sending out two hundred twenty-five. We're going to see a major, major land. You know, is it sports being eliminated? Possibly. Is it sports being suspended? But man, the the the, the bank accounts are, are are not what they used to be. And boy, if you threw football on that. I think you'd have a lot of athletic programs, particularly Division Two, Division Three, NAIA, NAIA. I think you might have division, uh, lower division athletic programs eliminated, not just sports. But yes, it's it's going to be a windfall. It's going to be a negative windfall for sure. Yeah, I'd be anxious to see, you know, if a lot of spring sports and a lot of programs get axed. You know, yeah. Whether it's the the soccer teams, the the lacrosse, the men's, you know, men's and women's track. I mean, sure. you hate to see that, but some schools are going to probably have to do it. Shane, Shane we had um, my intern dug up a really good uh, Ross Dellinger, a good writer who wrote, was a beat writer for LSU for years. He threw a thing up and my intern found it. We had it. Um, it was LSU's athletic program. And LSU's a pretty good, I mean, LSU's Florida. LSU is Alabama. LSU's, tech, you know, big boy program, power five. Using them as an example, in the 17, I think it was 2017 18 season, LSU, 17 total sports, men's and women's. Football made a profit of about, I'm doing this on memory, football made a profit of about 56 million. Basketball made a nice solid profit. LSU baseball made a half a million dollars. So they at least self sustained. Everything below that was in the red, losing money, including like women's basketball cost the university right at four million dollars i mean you gotta believe that's every every year um what i also think might happen at least in a temporary situation and this is going to be sticky i think the ncaa may go um may announce at some point soon to be a division one sports program you have to have 14 total sports and now it's got to lean heavy to to women or be equal because of Title IX. you got to have 14 total sports. I could see the NCAA come out and say, hey, Division One, for a year or two, we can knock this thing down. Now, then you got to figure out if you knock it down for a year or two so you don't have to carry so many sports that are losing you money, how do you suspend sports? Who do, who do you suspend? Are you really suspending, or are you just calling it a suspension? You're never going to bring them back. But uh, I can see the NCAA lightening the um, 14 sports to stay Division One. But I think, Shane, again, I think 
everything is on the table now. Everything. If you can think about it, it's going to get discussed. Yeah, we're speaking with Terry Norvell from College Sports Today. You can check his show out on Facebook Live. Uh, you can follow him at Twitter at Norvell underscore Terry. Terry, uh, sticking with college football, um, what what are your thoughts on the the tweet that Mike Leach sent Ooh, out and that man. kid ended up transferring? Uh, he's catching a lot of heat about that. Well, he had a my, Coach Leach had, Leach had a weird week. Did he gets this massive verbal commitment from a highly ranked quarterback, and then. You know, he sent out the tweets, um, tasteless in a lot of eyes. The young man, Fabian Lovett, uh, took offense to a defensive tackle that they think is a pretty good player. He cited that. He's out of there. I'll tell you, um, you know, Shane, you're from that area. I mean, you know the history of Mississippi, and, and boy, that noose is a, is a, can be an ugly symbol, you know, to some people, and you got to respect that. You know, isn't that, though, what you get with Coach Leach? I mean, Coach Leach, he's a – He's a, he's a, he says what's on his mind. Sometimes he fires first and thinks seconds. And, uh, boy, it's been, been a, been a tough week for him. I've been really tough week. And, and, you know, he's, he's in an area that I'm not going to say he doesn't fit, but he's different than, than the Mississippi state standard guy. You know, he's, he's, right. he's eclectic and, and, uh, he, 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 I, Mississippi State, they got to understand this comes with Mike Leach, though. This isn't anything this week that he did that's out of character. Mike Leach fires from the hip. Yeah, he really does. And I, but I think once football starts, I think yeah. they will enjoy him there. Yeah. Hey, hey folks, Jackie Spreads, who's currently on leave, is brought to you by Peachland Dentistry, Gator Nation's number one choice for dentistry in Port Charlotte and surrounding areas. We're speaking with Terry Novell. Terry, switching gears a little bit. Uh, there was a report coming out yesterday about Major League Baseball trying to take all the teams, I believe, to Phoenix, Arizona, and kind of quarantine everyone there and play games there. What do you think about that? Well, number one, I, 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 again, I think just the progressive thinking tells me that, that that's a good sign for, A, the virus as a whole worldwide, and B, the sports world. Uh, yeah, it sounds a little far-fetched, though, to kind of – Pin down some teams. What they want to do is be able to quarantine, like you said, and 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 protect and no fans, protect the players, and be able to have everybody in one you know sanitized area. I I think it's a, a hell of an undertaking that that massive. But Shane, I just love the fact that these entities are thinking about their sports and, and playing because you know getting back like to the uh, to the three golf tournaments. No, the PGA um, and, and Augusta National, you know, Augusta is their own thing. They, they run their own tournament. Augusta National and the PGA, they don't have law, law enforcement real jur- uh, uh, jurisdiction. But, you know, when you're that big, when you're the NFL, you can get feelers and find out stuff that, that the public can't find out as quick. You know, mm-hmm. all of this tells me that there's there's a real good fit. I just don't think these golf tournaments, going back to that, I don't think they would – risk having to cancel a second time if they're not really, really pretty sure their information is saying they're going to be able to pull these tournaments off in August, September, and November. I I, I just got to think that's a really, really good sign. Yeah, it makes you feel good, absolutely, if you enjoy sports. Terry Norvell from College Sports Today on the Titan MRI hotline from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. Okay, so Terry, I know you're a college guy, but yeah. the NFL is kind of plugging along and they're sure. going to have their draft, kind of how we all do our fantasy football drafts sitting yeah. there, you know, in our living room. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, you can see that coming. You knew. And again, the NFL, I don't think they're trying to save this draft electronically, which they're doing. So, so it can help the 2021 season. I think this is a good sign, man. Yes, they're going to do it electronically, but um, uh, I, I think, and they're the biggest of the big boys. The NFL, you talk about, they don't have medical jurisdiction or, or law enforcement jurisdiction. The NFL can find stuff out. Roger Goodell can get his Rolodex and find out some high-ranking people that know what's going on or think they know what's going on medically with the country and the virus. So I, I, th- I think I saw it coming. We're in a, a, a technological age where it makes a lot of sense. They can drive. They can have 32 Facebook Lives set up and, and what do you call it, FaceTime and all that and get it done. But I take it as just a great, great sign, man, great sign. Yeah, um, I, like I said, I know you're a college guy, but I, I'd like to get your thoughts uh, yeah. on Tom Brady 
going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, do you think the Bucs are a contender now? I think it's, isn't that, isn't that the typical Bucs though? I mean, here they are, they get Tom Brady, um, the legend, and, and what percentage is he? I don't, I don't know. You know that better than I, but here's Tampa, they barely get to capitalize on it. I know they had some boost, but, uh, um, from what I understand, man, there's a ton of weapons on offense. I'm not positive about their defense, but from what I understand, you know, there's a ton of um, a, a ton of weapons for Brady uh, offensively. Um, it, 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 I, it, I want to see it. You know, I, it's always shocking. Though I know we see those transposed Brady with a Buccaneers helmet and all that. It, it doesn't shock you until you actually see him on a Sunday when you see Brady wearing that uniform on the field like you saw. Joe Namath switching uniforms and 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 um, Montana and and all those guys. It, it's a shock though, isn't it, to see those those legendary one franchise guys with a different uniform on? Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, Terry, we appreciate you joining the program. Let everybody know how they can check out college sports today. Yeah, we do it on um, Monday and Friday, uh, high noon or, or high noon Monday and Friday, and um, it, it's on all the platforms. Uh, go, go to Facebook Live and, and bang in the the show name College Sports Today, like it. Follow it. Do the same with YouTube, the, the the channel, and again, College Sports today, Monday and um, Monday and Friday at noon. Shane, one one more quick thing. I tell you, one thing that really has got these coaches at the college level busy as heck is <clears throat> you realize they've got to basically interview all their roster. Roster management is a huge thing, particularly with the schools and uh, the programs that just got extra year. Right, they got their eligibility put back. The um, the spring sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How many, you know, you got a lot of seniors on your team that you need to talk to. Hey, um, hey, uh, second baseman for XYZ school, are you planning on coming back or are you going to go take that job you've already got lined up because you're a senior? Are you going to just go ahead and get married because your girlfriend has been wanting to get married for four years? Yeah, boy, r- roster management is going to be a, a, a hell of an undertaking for a, a, a lot of these college uh, coaches and teams and, and programs. It'll be, it's, it's, it's a lot of way through. And the NCAA, boy, I feel for the NCAA. They have got a monster, a 10 or 12 monster jobs facing them right now. Yeah, no doubt about it. Terry, good stuff, my man. We'll talk to you on down the road. Stay safe over there, buddy. Shane, anytime. Talk to you, buddy. Terry Norvell from College Sports Today. Join us on the Titan Amora Hotline. Hey, folks, at Center State Bank, we put business first. We are the largest community bank in the state of Florida. Center State has five convenient Latch County locations to serve you better. Come in and experience the Center State difference. To learn more, visit centerstatebank.com. Center State Bank, member FDIC. We're going to take a time out here. When we come back, we'll be joined by Gator Hall of Famer, one of the best defensive backs to ever play, ever wear the orange and blue. Kiwan Ratliff will join us. You're watching and listening to Crime uh, <laughs> That would be pot up with Matthews in the morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. We'll be right back. Time out! Time out! Hey! Time out! Time out! Time out! There we go. Good. We want to take this moment to thank all our sponsors who keep the show going and pay the bills. Let's give them something to show for now. Our gridiron sponsors are Crime Prevention Security, small enough to serve you, large enough to care. Titan MRI. Gainesville's only locally owned and operated MRI facility. Peachland Dentistry, Gator Nation's number one choice for dentistry in Port Charlotte and surrounding areas. Area Rug Masters, your number one choice for rug cleaning. And Pound Hurt, preferred personal injury attorneys. Our touchdown sponsors are Gator BTW, Campus USA Credit Union, Celebration Point Town Center, Tropical Smoothie Cafe, The Keys Grill and Piano Bar, UF Mover Guys, The Digital Mortgage Guy, Adams Ribs, Cloud Nine Spa, Cold Stone Creamery, Gator Domino's, Celebrate Primary Care, Center State Bank. If you are interested in promoting your business on the show, you can visit our website, potupwithshane.com and click on the Advertise button or call Freddie Weeby at 352-284-3733. Again, thank you for all the great businesses that support the show. Please remember, if you like what we are doing here, thank our sponsors and support the businesses that support us. He's locking, still locking. He's going for the end zone. He's got a touchdown! (laughs) 
Welcome back. Pot up with Matthews in the morning from the Crime Prevention Security System System Studios, large enough to serve you, small enough to care. Um, we're going to go now to the Titan MR hotline, and we're going to be joined by Hall of Famer here at the University of Florida, SEC Defensive Player of the Year, and a longtime NFL guy, also now Coach Mullins' Assistant Director of Player Personnel at the University of Florida, Kiwan Ratliff. Kiwan, welcome to the program. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good. Appreciate you for having me. Yeah, man. Um, well, let's let's talk about what Kiwan Ratliff is doing right now to pass his time. Man, you bored to death? Uh, not really. Honestly, you know, I'm, I'm getting a chance to get caught up on a lot of film. Uh, you know, I, I get a chance to get paid to do what I love. So why not sit at home and get caught up on a lot of this film a lot of these kids are sitting in? So uh, right now, I know one of the big things that a lot of former players have really enjoyed, uh, you along with the, your graphics guy, Kevin Camps, uh, have put together these little, I don't even know what you call them. What do you call them? These, these, former, these little pictures of former players in different uniforms? Uh, oh, they're, they're, uh, basically, we, we uh, call them the cartoon characters. Cartoon characters, yes. Yeah. So uh, I know they just popped up mine on the screen here that you can't see, um, but it's. Uh, I, I just know it's. It, it's been great for y'all to do that because I've had a lot of former players reach out to me, uh, really appreciating y'all thinking about the guys in the past. Um, so Kiwan, let's look at your career. You're you're a kid that grew up in the state of Ohio. Um, what made you decide to come to the University of Florida, and what other schools were you looking at? Uh, well, you know, growing up in Ohio, of course, you know, that's Big Ten and, and the MAC conference. That's what pretty much dominates the state. So growing up, I was in Youngstown. I was always a, a Penn State fan. I know a lot of people always ask me, why did you go to Ohio State or did you consider Ohio State? I mean, of course, as an Ohio kid, I looked at Ohio State and, and they were a great school. They were a winning program, put guys at NFL, but it just didn't seem like my cup of tea growing up. I was always a rooting against the team that played against Ohio State for some reason, either <laughs> Michigan, Penn State, Purdue, whoever it was at the time that was, was decent, that would give them a run for their money. That was the team that I, I rooted for. So growing up, I was always looking at, at going to school in the Big Ten. But when I moved to Columbus in seventh grade, uh, I got introduced to a, a guy, Scott Gordon. Coach Gordon is a was was my high school coach and if you didn't know he was a GA at the University mm -hmm. of Florida. Yep. So he was the one that first piqued my interest my interest on the University of Florida. But at the time, you know, we didn't have a lot of all the channels and all the YouTube and all the internet to be able to watch all the games. So I didn't really see a lot of Florida games. So, you know, he would he would say stuff like that, but I really didn't pay attention. But it wasn't until Coach Stoops came in and started recruiting me being a, a former I mean, a fellow Youngstown guy, he was the one that, that came in and got me truly interested in the University of Florida. Well, it's funny you mentioned Scott Gordon because, uh, you know, the, our, my show is on Facebook Live, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all those type uh, things, uh, keep on. And on the Pound Hurt um, Facebook Live comment section, your preferred business interruption attorney, Scott Gordon says, two of my favorite Gators together. And uh, so he, he's listening to you right now. I didn't realize that was the connection. And uh, he was a tremendous coach here and uh, for a long time with the University of Florida. That's pretty cool. Um, so, so Kiwan, so uh, you come to the University of Florida. Um, you know, you, you win a couple of uh, titles. You play for both Spurrier and Zook. What was it like playing for Coach Spurrier compared to playing for Coach Zook? Honestly, it wasn't that different as far as their their the way they they went about treating the players. Now, Coach Spurrier was a little bit a little bit more arrogant, a little bit more cocky because he he was a little bit more proven, of course. But what people don't know is that Coach Zook was a a, a great coach for uh, for players. He was one of those guys that would pull you to the side, ask you what you needed, what what he could do to help you to get to the top of your abilities, and, and he would go out and do it. I mean, my junior year. When he first came in, took over the job, he you can tell how much of a player coach he was when he came in and, and asked the seniors what they wanted. Some of those guys, uh, Bam Harvin, Mike Mateel, some of those guys went to wear black cleats. Coach Zook bucked the trend at the University of Florida and let the guys wear black cleats, which 
a lot of the fans may not have liked, but that was something that he did to help win over the players. But Coach Spurrier is my all-time favorite coach. Any coach that allows you to, to, to be who you are, to not care about, you know, saying the wrong thing to the media or, or giving bulletin board material, he didn't really care as much because he was going to give them that bulletin board material without you anyway. So a coach like that, it, it makes it easy for you to go out and be yourself and play to your, your fullest capabilities. We're speaking of Kiwan Ratliff on the Titan or Hotline. You can follow Kiwan on Twitter at Kiwan Ratliff. Kiwan, speaking of Coach Furrier, um, I, we had, I had Coach Dwayne Dixon on a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't realize this because I was playing in the league, and obviously I watched all our games and stuff. He said they always had a package for Kiwan at wide receiver. Um, how difficult, you being a defensive back, how difficult was that for you to, to learn what they wanted you to do if they inserted you on the offensive side of the football? Honestly, it wasn't difficult at all because – that was the reason why I came to the University of Florida was to play wide receiver. I was actually considering transferring when Coach Zook came in. I talked to Coach Gordon. I talked to my mom. And I was really ready to leave. I, I came in. I felt like I could play wide receiver at the University of Florida. I watched Jaquez Green, the highlight tape. He was a smaller wide receiver. He wore number five. That was my number in high school. And that was part of the sell, sell, uh, sales pitch when they recruited me. So when I got moved to defensive back for good, honestly, in my mind, I was gone. I was ready to go. I, I felt like I could play defensive back anywhere. So mm -hmm. when Kozuk came in, he sat down with me and, and uh, Rex Grossman and a couple of other coaches. And when he allowed me to play both ways my junior year, that was actually the reason why I didn't transfer. Okay. Well, we got a text here on the Titan or text line from Jed. He says, Kiwan. Which did you enjoy the most, returning a punt for a touchdown or an interception for a touchdown? Oh, it's always interception. Interception, to, you know, as a defensive back, you don't get to touch the ball a lot. So when you get your hands on the ball and you get to bring it back, I mean, that's a feeling that ignites the team. As punt return does as well, but for defensive players to score, it just brings a, a whole different vibe to the squad. Yeah, so you know, I don't think a lot of people realize you you hold the the uh, record for the most return yards in the punt game. You broke, as you mentioned, Jacquez Green uh, punt return yards. Um, do you have one punt return in your career that was the most exciting? Honestly, I, I got a few, but they they were called back, so they they all the same. <laughs> I mean, I. I I had a couple that I got in the end zone, but they got called back. I, I ain't going to blame nobody, but Marquand Manuel, Gus Scott, you two holding. <laughs> but uh, it's put, put return, uh, probably my the, the most exciting one for me, I would have to say, uh, would probably be LSU my senior year. Being a small guy, I never had the chance to run anybody over. So to be able to run over a punter, I don't care if it was the putter, it was somebody. I got a chance to run somebody over and feel like a like a big running back for a change. We're speaking to Kiwan Ratliff, who's now the assistant director of player personnel for the Florida Gators and the coach Mullen. We got a text here on the Titan Amar text line from Larry. Larry says, Who was the one wide receiver in college that you enjoy playing against the most? The receiver I enjoy playing against the most was probably the the receiver I had the toughest time covering. And it was uh, Anquan Bowden. The mm -hmm. reason why I loved playing against Anquan Bowden was because Anquan Bowden didn't take plays off. If it was a run play, he was going to try to put you under the bench. If it was a pass play, he was going to try to embarrass you. So he was the type of receiver that you couldn't take a play off and you couldn't rest at any game. And when I used to say how good he was in college, a lot of reporters, a lot of people would look at me crazy because there were other guys like Andre Johnson, Michael Clayton, Devery Henderson, some guys that, that had bigger names at the time than Anquan, but the NFL career that he had proved that he was just as his lead as I was saying he was back in college. Text here from Ted on the Titan Mar text line. It says, Kiwan, what was your favorite stadium besides the Swamp to play in? Oh, look, that's, that's easy for me. I mean, a lot of people won't understand this, but for me it was Kentucky. I loved playing at Kentucky because, once again, being an Ohio guy, my family didn't get to come to a lot of games. So anytime we played at Kentucky, I was going to have 30, 40 family members in the stands, 
And that was the one game that I could look forward to seeing my grandmother, my my brothers, my mom, my 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 cousins, my my whole extended family would come to that Kentucky game, and that would be the one game out of the year, every other year that I knew that I can go and have that that Youngstown slash Columbus homecoming. Steve says on the tight end mark text line, do you see any similarities in Coach Mullen and Coach Furrier? Oh, no, definitely. There's a lot of similarities. They're, as far as the way they, they go about preparing, it's, it's similar. The, the, their philosophies on, on offense is similar. It's similar, I'm sorry. And the one thing that I love about Coach Mullen is he's one of those, once again, I'm a uniform guy. He's one of those coaches that aren't real real strict about the uniform, and, and he allows his players to be comfortable, be who they are. This is a great text here. I'm anxious to see what you say on this one, Kiwan. And we're speaking with Kiwan Ratliff, Hall of Famer here from the University of Florida. Pat wants to know on the Titan Amara text line, since your time as a Gator, who would you say is the best defensive back to play at UF and you can't pick yourself? Oh, Lito Shepard. I don't even have to think about that. Uh, Lito Shepard did things that a lot of people didn't even realize he was doing. He he went in games and covered guys man to man effortlessly. He he dropped in his zone and, and and made plays in other zones outside of his area. He he knew his opponents in and out. He I mean Lito was arguably one of the best athletes that I ever played with, along with one of the smartest athletes that I ever played with. So me being a wide receiver at heart, I learned how to play the defensive back position by watching Lito Shepard. When you uh you got drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals, um, I mean that you know a lot of people don't want to play for the Cincinnati Bengals, uh, but you being an Ohio kid, were you excited to go play there? I'd be lying if I said I was. Uh, growing <laughs> up watching the, the Bungles, as we used to call them, I mean it was it it, it was never really uh, uh, exciting to wake up and watch the Bengals play on Sunday. So I was blessed, I was fortunate, and I, I realized my dream come true by being drafted to the Bengals. But in hindsight, it was one of those things that where I felt like uh, I went to a situation that wasn't the best for my career. But I got a chance to play in the NFL, and I got a chance to go back home, and my family got a chance to see every single one of my games. So that was a blessing. Did you enjoy playing for Marvin Lewis? I enjoy playing for Coach Lewis. Coach Lewis is a, is a great coach, great man. He he brought me back three different times, so he employed me three different times in, in, for the same team in the NFL, which is kind of unheard of. But I, I love the, the, the his philosophies. I love the way he went about uh, helping us get ready for the game. It was just we weren't fortunate enough to get more wins. Jack says on the Titan MR text line, Lito. Uh, Lito. I'm thinking of Lito when you talked about him a few months ago. Kiwan. What uh who was the most difficult quarterback you played against in the National Football League? Uh the most difficult? Uh I, I probably have to say Brett Favre. But when we played against uh Green Bay and, and Brett Favre, I remember, you know, as a zone dropper playing the nickel, I, I spent the majority of my career in the NFL in the slot. So when we would play zones, I remember our defensive coordinators and DB coaches would always say, you know, break on his eyes, break on his eyes, follow his eyes, move with his eyes. And Brett Favre was the first quarterback that I've ever seen in my life throw a no-look pass. So <laughs> they're telling us to break with it or, or move with his eyes or move with his shoulders, break when he throws. Brett Favre would be looking at the deep ball and throw the check down like he was playing basketball. So it was a little tough to, to figure Brett Favre out, especially with the, gut, the the cannon that he had. He could make that no-look throw across his body, make it seem like it was a flat route he was throwing. We're speaking to Kiwan Ratliff on the Titan MRI hotline, former SEC Defensive Player of the Year. Kiwan, once you were done with your, your NFL days, uh, you were living in the Orlando area, and you started the Rat Pack, which a lot of people aren't probably familiar with the Rat Pack, but it's a seven-on-seven team teams you had multiple teams and you did a tremendous job with these high school and, and youth kids and not only would you take them to tournaments but you also took them to, uh, on your little tour of different colleges so they could get acclimated with different schools and coaches could see them talk a little bit about what that meant to you uh starting the rat pack oh the rat pack meant everything to me 
growing up, you know, as a kid, you you dream to do things and you hope to do things and you pray and you you wish for these things to happen. But a lot of times kids don't know how to make them happen or have never seen anybody who's made it happen. So when I got done playing, I wanted to make sure that I could reach back and, and help as many kids as I could and help them understand that this really wasn't a dream. It was a goal. So for those kids that, that had those goals, I just wanted to put those, some of those things in front of them to where they seen guys who did it. They seen guys going through it and they learned how to do it. So if you you're around guys who, who are doing what you want to do and you see what they've done, it's, it's no longer a dream to you. Now it's reality. Now you can see what they did and you can pattern some of the things that you do behind what they did to try to become halfway as successful as them. So I wanted to give back to kids that were in my position that looked like me, that act like me, that thought like me. And I wanted them to see that they could do it no matter what their teachers or parents or aunts and uncles were saying, that if they, they did everything the right way, they may not, that may not reach the moon, but they may have landed on the stars. And that's what we call a division one, division two, division three, free education. Kiwan Ratliff is our guest here on the Titan Amara text line from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. Joe says on the text line, what college quarterback that you faced was the one that you hated playing against the most? Uh, the, the one that I hated playing against the most was Jared Lorenzen. <laughs> like, uh, Jared Lorenzen with like, him and Derek Abney. Those two were, you know, they were a pain in my butt. I mean, they weren't the, the the most most you know the biggest names or or the guys that people talked about, but for some reason that combination gave me fits in college. Uh, Derek Abney was sneaky fast. Well, I shouldn't say sneaky fast. He ran a four three, so that's not sneaky. But and Jared Lorenzen could throw the ball a mile, and he threw it like it was a bullet. So. Jerry Lorenzen was the one quarterback that when we played against them, I knew he was going to try me. No matter if I had three interceptions in the first quarter, he was still going to come back at me in the second quarter. So he was that quarterback that you couldn't kind of bait and lower to sleep because he didn't care. Kiwan, a lot of people may not know this, but I want to say whether it was three or four years ago, you decided to come back to the University of Florida and get your degree. What did it mean to, to, to graduate from the University of Florida? Oh, that meant everything to me. I mean, I I was living a life a, a, as a hypocrite. I was preaching to all the kids that I was working with in the Rat Pack, as you just mentioned. I had 200-something kids go to school, and I would always tell them, don't let these schools take advantage of you. Go get that paper. Degree is the most important thing you can do. Whether you make it to the NFL or not, that degree will still work for you 20 years from the time you retire. And I would say all of this. And in the back of my mind, I would be thinking to myself, I don't even have my degree. So my kids were getting a little older. My son, I'm preaching to him that he has to go to school. He has to graduate. You have to go to school. You have to graduate. But I hadn't did it. So my wife sat me down and was like, hey, I think it's about time. So I went ahead and went back. And the best feeling in the world for me was to see the faces on my son and my daughter as I walked across that stage. That's good stuff. We got a uh, you're going to like this. one. we got a comment here on Facebook Live, brought to you by Pound Hurt, your preferred business interruption attorney. It comes from Trey Jones. He says, the Rat Pack was a great organization. My son Eli played there, and he says, hello, coach. So, uh, um, tell, tell, tell him, I, I, I'm going to need me a ride in that limousine when this is all, all over with. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that, that's pretty cool. Um, so, so, key one. So, now... You, you 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 leave the Rat Pack. Dan Mullen approaches you about coming in and, and working with the uh, the school that you played for, which I think that's every former player's dream is if you want to get into some type of coaching or personnel is to go where you play. Talk a little bit about what your role is as the assistant director of player personnel. Oh, my my role is uh, is simple. The way I, the way I explain it to a lot of the younger kids and a lot of people, you know, that's, that's my age is it's similar to the video game that we all play, the, the college football game. When you play the dynasty at the end of the year, you, you know, you recruited guys, you, you managed the roster, 
you, you you had to go out and find guys. And, and that's what I do at University of Florida. I recruit guys. I, I find the, the diamonds in the rough. I watch film. And I put guys in front of the coaches that I feel are good enough to play at the University of Florida. So my job basically is to watch through all the film that guys send in and all the film that a lot of our, our students find and break down who's a fit for the University of Florida. So when you talk about watching film, let everybody know, like, how many hours a week would you say or a day that you watch film? And at what age do you start watching kids? Like when they're seventh graders, eighth graders, or do you wait till they get into high school? Well, it's, it's, it's tricky. As far as watching film throughout the week, I mean, there's no set time of how much film I watch. I get sheets. So there may be 25 guys on that sheet of paper to watch that day. There may be 15 guys that day. Sometimes you may have to go back and rewatch film of a guy that a coach wants to get another breakdown of. There may be new film that you get from a kid. So there's there's never a set amount of time that I watch film, but the majority of my day is catered to watching film. So, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say, like I said, exactly how much. But as far as when we watch film, I try not to watch film unless a kid has varsity film. And that gets tricky because you have some states that seventh, eighth graders can play varsity if they're good enough. Then you have some states that wait till freshman year that, that you're allowed to play varsity. So if a kid is playing varsity and his film is elite, then I'll watch it if he's in seventh grade, if he's in eighth grade. I like to be, you know, one of the first guys to get on those elite guys that are just can't miss talents. We're speaking to Kiwan Ratliff on the Titan MR text line. If you got a text for him, send it to 352-353-7465. Uh, we have one from Frank. Uh, he says, Kiwan, what are your thoughts on the new proposed football facility? Will that help the program? Oh, no doubt. No doubt that'll help the program. When you when you listen to the, a lot of these other coaches' sales pitches, me being able to, to be on the other side, as you said, taking kids to – to different universities, to different colleges, seeing different campuses, seeing different amenities that a lot of these schools are offering, you hear the negative talk about the University of Florida. You hear the backlash that a lot of these coaches say about our facilities, and they are outdated. So the only way to be able to truly have those elite number one classes, number two classes in the country, you have to have some facilities to back up that big talk that we're talking. So once we once we redid the, the Hawkins Center, you can hear all the, the talk and, and everything coming from the recruits when they came through about how beautiful it was. But we were still lacking on a lot of other things. So now once that new facility goes up, now a lot of those schools won't be able to negative recruit us. And now those kids will be able to come in and see that they have a lot of the same things that they could have at these other universities. Yeah, I agree 100 percent with that. I've been preaching for a long time because, as you know, I took my son around all the schools in the southeast and and we're we got to get on a level playing field here quickly uh, exactly sarah, <clears throat> sarah sends a, a text here wants to know kiwan what's your favorite game you played in the swamp my favorite game that i played in the swamp uh, I, I it's hard to say the favorite game because i mean there in the swamp it was it, every single game to me was a memory being in the swamp that's it, the stadium is like no other to me the, the crowd, and, and at that time, especially, you know, in the, in the, the early 2000s, it, it was never an empty seat. So every game, no matter if it was us playing against Marshall uh, with, with, with those guys that, that they had back with Leftwich and those guys, it was going to sound like we were playing in, in, in a national championship. So every game in the Swamp is a, is a great memory for me, but I'd have to say my most memorable game, if I had to pick one, would probably be Vanderbilt my senior year because that was the game I broke the single season interception record. In. Text here from Jack. He wants to know, Kiwan, do you stay in contact with a lot of your former Gator teammates? <laughs> it's funny that, that you asked that. I'm, I mean, I'm sitting here now. I'm, I'm filling in the last names of my list of the guys who got the cartoon characters. And mm -hmm. I mean, by doing this, it got me. It gave me a chance to reach back to so many guys that I hadn't talked to in so so many years. So now, I've got in my my phone. I've got over 400 former players' numbers now. So I may not have talked to them all as much over the years, but now that I have their info, and now that I'm back at Florida, I'll be reaching out to those guys annually. 
<laughs> I was just thinking about how I can see you sitting here, your phone getting blown up about all everybody wants a cartoon character made of them. And speaking of that, so when Kevin does these things, how long does it take him to do each individual part of player? Uh, see, Kevin, Kevin's is he's a beast on, on the graphics. I mean, you come up with an idea, you give it to Kevin, and Kevin uh, bring it to reality and make it ten times better than you imagine. So Kevin is 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 one of those guys that he doesn't let you watch him work. He works on his own, and then he gives it to you. So with the characters, it was crazy because it started off with maybe 30, 35 guys that was getting one. And then after that first day of the first probably 10 to 15 guys that sent them out, we had requests from everybody. So, <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, I sent Kevin, no, no exaggeration. I sent Kevin 55 to 60 every five to 10 hours the last couple of days. And Kevin has been just churning them out. So he's got over 300 of those things made in less than a day. So wow. I don't know how long it takes him to do most of them, but this one, I mean, it's, it was, it wasn't as hard for this one. I don't think because it wasn't as personalized and individualized for each player. So as it was a cartoon character, but it still is a lot of work to go in and change the skin tones and the numbers and the Jersey colors mm-hmm. and helmets and everything. A lot of requests that the guys had. So, I mean, I, I love what Kevin do, but I don't want to do what Kevin does. <laughs> yeah, he's he's uh he does a tremendous job. We're speaking of Kiwan Ratliff. We got a few more minutes with him. He's assistant director, of player personnel, Gator Hall of Famer, SEC Defensive Player of the Year. Um, let's talk a little bit about Coach Mullen, what he's done in his two years. Do you? Do you I, I don't want to say are you surprised because we know what his track record was when he was here before and what he did at Mississippi State. But do you think he's a little ahead ahead of schedule going into year three? I truly do. I mean, if you look at where the program was when he came in and took over and where we're at right now, I figured that we would be getting to where we've been the last two years by year three. If you look at most coaches that come in the big time programs like like Florida or, or the you know the Ohio States, the Florida States, those schools, you, you rarely have those guys that step right in and, and take a elite program that was kind of on a downward spiral, downward spiral and bring them right back initially in year one. And for him to come out and get 10 wins with a team that he didn't recruit, players he may not have known that well, and to come out and, and make it look like these were all his guys and these were hand-picked players for his system was amazing to me. So I was, I'm just looking forward to seeing how the program is going to be once he gets a chance to put his name and his fingerprint all over it. So during this time right now, obviously, I kind of understand what's going on with, you know, usually I think people don't realize kids are on campus. They have scheduled workouts individually or in a group, and then they have team workouts. They also, you know, they got plenty of food to eat, the nutrition tables and things of that nature. With, With the way the world is right now. I've seen it personally because of kids at my house doing it. Uh, it's got to be difficult for you guys as a staff um, not having everyone on campus and kids not being able to actually lift weights. I mean, I know they have workouts from Coach Savage and his strength staff, but, you know, when, you, when you're not pumping iron in football, it's got to be a concern. Um, you know, f- from a staff perspective, uh, you keeping tabs on all of the guys or are you helping with that? Well, honestly, that's all on Coach Savage. I mean, it's one of those ones where Coach Savage is sending out daily routines for guys to do. Guys are challenging each other by position groups. Guys are, you know, trying to stay ahead of the curve. But in this time, it's hard, as you said, because not only do some of these guys not have access to weights, some of these guys aren't eating the same. Like, you know, some guys, you know, their, their home situation isn't as structured and isn't as put together as it is here at the University of Florida. So now when they go home, they don't get to have those three or four meals a day. They don't get to have the the Gatorade shakes and little things that you take for granted that when you just walk by and there's a, a Gatorade machine full of Gatorades to drink. And when they go home and they don't have those those things, now not only are they not working out, but now they're not eating properly, so they're losing weight. So those are some of the things that you're concerned with 
uh, along with guys not running, staying in shape. So you want to try to get things back the way they were as fast as possible. So that's why when people say, oh, you need to come back and start the season in July or some of these, you know, the people have these theories of how you should do it. I don't think that those are the best solutions because the fact that a lot of these kids have broken off of their, their daily routines of eating, lifting, and working out. So when, when they do make a decision to come back, <clears throat> you, you think we probably need, what, uh, six to eight weeks to get kids back to normal, uh, somewhat back to normal with the, the training, with the strength staff, the eating properly, and then going into practice? You think, what, six to eight weeks before a season can start? I think minimum six weeks before a season can start. Uh, I would say more along the lines of eight to ten weeks. Because, yeah. like you said, you got to get them back into that regimen. You got to get them back healthy. You got to get them back to where their their bodies are ready to take on the 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 the, the hits and the, the beatings, the bangs that you're gonna take throughout an SEC season. And you don't want to do that too fast because then you'll have a rash of injuries with guys throughout the country, and the season will be watered down anyway. Well, we got one last text here for you, and we really appreciate you joining the show today. It comes from Larry on the Titan Mark text line. He wants to know how good can Elam be as a defensive back here? Oh, Kyrie Elam can, can be one of the best to ever play here. If, if he continues to, to keep his nose in the books, to keep grinding, keep grinding, keep training, keep listening to, to Coach Gray and Coach English and Coach Grantham, he can be one of the best to ever play here. Simply off the fact that he's got knowledge instilled in him that he doesn't even know he has. He has a dad that played many years in the NFL, an uncle that played uh, many years in the, well, a few years in the NFL, first round draft pick. And the things that they taught him as a kid are things that he does naturally now. So you couple that with his size, his speed, his athleticism, and his willing willingness to learn, that kid can be awesome. If he continues to grow and everything you know, works in his favor, he can be one of the best to ever play here. Well, good deal. Well, Kiwan, that's good stuff, my man. I appreciate you taking your time out and joining our program. Keep doing the great work you're doing over there at the school. And uh, like I said, stay safe, my man. I appreciate it, man. Anytime. All right. That's Kiwan Rattler, University of Florida Hall of Famer. Uh, now uh, helps from the uh, Player Personnel Department for Coach Dan Mullen joining the program on the Titan MR Hotline. And, folks, uh, tomorrow's show, first of all, I want to get to a couple of our comments on our Pound Hurt, which is brought to you by your preferred business interruption attorneys. Some Facebook Live comments. Rick says, good show. We appreciate you listening, Rick. Mary says, always enjoy these interviews. Brings back uh, great memories, as I have been going to Gator games since 1958. So she's uh, she's watched a lot of Gators play. And uh, Fred says, great, great interview. Uh, we appreciate Kiwan taking his time out. He's done a great job since Dan Mullins hired him over there. Um, he's got a great relationship with so many high school athletes, high school coaches, parents, and what have you. Um, don't forget tomorrow, uh, before, tomorrow, before I tell you who we got on our show tomorrow, Celebration Point is where the Gators come to celebrate with premium brands like Bass Pro Shop, Tommy Hilfiger, Hotel Indigo, Nike Medici's, Regal Cinemas, and coming soon to HBC's new restaurant, Spurrier's Gridiron Grill. We will see you at Celebration Point where the Gators come to celebrate. Also forgot to, to do our today's um, today, this day in sports, which is brought to you by your area rug masters. Is your whole family stuck at home and tracking in more than usual? Take your rugs to area rug masters for a BOGO rug cleaning. When you mention the coach Shane, call 352-448-5999. And we're going to go back to Augusta National. Uh, where 23-year-old Jack Nicholas wins his first of his record six green jackets with a three-foot par putt on the final hole. And uh, so that was 1963 when Jack won his first green jacket. Um, so on tomorrow's show, we're going to have from The Athletic, who also used to write for Sports Illustrated, former Gator football player under Steve Spurry, Andy Staples is going to join the program. Thursday, former Gator linebacker Jerry Odom, who's now – the head football coach at Tusculum College. He was a former assistant under Ron Zook at Florida. He uh, under uh, assistant under Kerwin Bell at Jacksonville University and then took over uh, several years ago at Tusculum College and does a tremendous job up there. So um, 
And then on Friday is a special guest that we will probably announce tomorrow. I'm um, looking forward to that as well. So I want to thank Kiwan Ratliff, Terry Norvell for joining us today. Folks, be safe out there today. You've been watching and listening to Pot Up with Matthews in the Morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. We'll be same place tomorrow. Be safe. Take care.